praise the Lord, everybody. Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. How many was glad when they said unto you, let us go into the house of the Lord? How many is thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Praise God. Hope you have your Bibles ready. If you've got your Bibles, raise it up here tonight. We're getting ready to study the Word of the Lord. I'm thankful that we have a foundation we can lean on in a world that is ever-changing. We have a Word that we can depend on. I'm excited about what we're going to learn about tonight and uh, what God is going to speak and to say to each of us. And so if you're ready and hope you have something to take notes on, maybe the Spirit of the Lord might stir something in you to study, to go further Uh, to discover more about him, more about what he is saying to the church. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that tonight. Praise God. Is this uh, raring to go? Are we ready? We've got, uh, it is. We're going to try it here tonight. Let's see. Nope. Can you come up and help me make the magic happen if you can? I think I'm I'm pushing the right button. Got it turned on. Tried that out. Uh, Last time in our Bible study, we discovered that what we're going to learn is founded on three uh, on three truths. Number one is that the Bible is an integrated message. Everybody say an integrated message. So there's nothing in the Word of God that is of happenstance or that is simply thrown in there. Uh, God has a way of making sure that every place and every number and uh, every name is, it means something. It's important. And so it is an integrated message system. Uh, Secondly, it is of extraterrestrial origin. We're going to talk about uh, the meaning of that extraterrestrial uh, design. Number three, it's written around a central theme. Somebody say a central theme. Theme, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the story uh, of the Bible. Uh, The first five books uh, of the Bible are called... The, the Pentateuch, the Torah. And so uh, because it's pivotal to everything we're going to be dealing with, we're going to spend a little bit more time in the Torah. Are you going to have to click there, or can I, uh, can I use that here tonight? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Amen. Nope. What did I do? Wrong button? This one here? Am I hitting it right? Yep, that should be it. Should be it technology. Isn't it one? Aren't you thankful the Word of God never changes? All right, somebody's going to have to come up here and help me because I, I feel like I'm pushing the right buttons. Let's make sure it's, it's right. We're going to need these tonight, so uh, help me out with that just a little bit. So we're going to talk about the beginning of all things. We're going to talk about the beginning of all things. Genesis, uh, the very first book in your Bible, has 50 chapters, and all of the major doctrines of the Bible have their roots in the book of of Genesis, so the oneness of God, sin, salvation, separation, covenant, death and resurrection, faith, uh, many more doctrines are found in the book of Genesis, just right at the very beginning of your Bible. Uh, and so that's important for us to understand. That's why Genesis is so powerful and foundational to what we're going to talk about for these next several weeks. But more than that, uh, just as all the major doctrines of our faith are answered in the Bible, so are all of the false philosophies answered in the book of Genesis. So atheism, atheism claims that there is no God. But Genesis asserts that all creation is by God. Pantheism says that God is in everything. He's in the tree. He's in the chair that you're sitting on, uh, that he's in the camera, that he's in the grass, or that he's in the birds. Genesis teaches, though, that God is transcendent. He's above, and he is distinguishable from his creation. Polytheism claims that there are many gods, but Genesis, again, emphasizes there is only one true God. In fact, just in Hinduism alone, uh, if you can imagine this, there are over 33 million gods in Hinduism alone. 33 million gods. Whether you're talking three or 33 million, there is only one true God. And Genesis lays that out. It is imperative that we begin there, the one uh, one true God. Materialism. Materialism claims that uh, universe is eternal. And Genesis shows that even matter has a beginning. Humanism says that man determines the ultimate reality. Genesis says that God does. So are we here? Are we uh, ready to rock? Am I going to have to click on these? All right, we'll just do it this way right here. All right. 
Evolution says everything evolved gradually from one big genetic blob to what we are today, right? So here we are just uh, from a big bang. But Genesis asserts that God created all things. Uniformitarianism claims that everything is moving along as it always has. Genesis shows God's intervention in history. It's just important for us to understand how important Genesis is. It's foundational to every question, uh, to, to every issue that we deal with within life. So we're going to start in the beginning. So Genesis chapter 1 begins with those words, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And if you embrace and accept that verse, it will unlock every other problem in scripture. That right there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In fact, I don't have time to go into Bereshit here tonight. In beginning, I don't have time to go into that. But even in within the very first word of your Bible, in the very first book of Genesis, God lays out the plan for the redemption of all mankind. So Genesis chapter 1, it's the very beginning. It's imperative that we understand that. Genesis 1 through Three. So if you've got your Bibles, open it up to Genesis chapter 1, the first three verses. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And what I love about this, when you look at in the beginning, God, I love the parallels between the Old Testament and New Testament because remember, it's an integrated message system. And the, the, the Old Testament has the New Testament concealed. And in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed, what God really was planning all throughout um, time. And so whenever you look at Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God. When you go to the New Testament book of John, the very first words in the book of John chapter 1 are, in the beginning was the Word. Revealing to us that the man Christ Jesus is the same God of the Old Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made, or the Word was God. The Word was with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, letting us know that Jesus was the blueprint for which God created everything. For the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. How is that possible? How was Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain from the very foundation of the world? Because when God already had it formulated, He already had a blueprint. You've seen a set of blueprints. This building, before it was built, had a set of blueprints. Your home did. Uh, you, you have a set of blueprints that you look at before you even begin to build. And so before God even began to create things, He had a blueprint, and that was Jesus Christ. If you want to know if you're your life is measuring up to what God wants you to be, you don't have to look any further than into the face of Jesus. He's your blueprint. Don't measure yourself to other people around you. Don't measure yourself to somebody sitting a row ahead of you. Don't measure yourself to somebody who, who, who speaks or sings or who teaches or who, who, who does, has a bigger job or more money than you do. You need to measure yourself to the man Christ Jesus. And if you see that you don't quite measure up, then just go back to God. Say, I need more of your spirit within me. Transform me. Make me who you want me to be. So I love, the, uh, I love the parallels here. In the beginning, God. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Another parallel between Genesis and John. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament. For John said of Jesus that in him was life. And that life was the light of men. So in Genesis, God's Spirit brought light. And in John, the Spirit brought light through the life of Jesus. So God wants to bring light to humanity. That was the story from the very beginning. Uh, verse 2 continues, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night, the evening, and the morning were the first day. It's easy to kind of glance through these scriptures and think I've read them before. I've heard these scriptures before, but just in the few verses of Genesis, it already poses questions and confronts us with some fundamental uh, issues. Is the universe really 15 billion years old? Was it created in just six days? What do we mean by six days? Does the scripture mean 24-hour days? 
And since the stars are so far away, is it possible that God just created light already in transit? Some say that the aging factors were built into the initial creation. Others say if that's the case that God would be a liar, he made the universe look old when it's not. Were these the first days of Genesis geologic uh, eras? Uh, I remember taking a Torah class with a professor in college that literally took two weeks discussing just the first three verses of Genesis. Just the first three verses. So what's really going on in these verses? We're not going to spend three weeks in it. We've only got just a few minutes. And so I want us to kind of dive into the beginning here and, and talk about it. You and I take for granted that time is linear, absolute, something that starts and ends. Time was created. So we need to look at time just for a moment to understand about the nature of God and his plan and what he was doing. We assume that eternity is like a line that is infinitely long starting at infinity on the left going to infinity on the right and when we think of God we probably envision someone who has lots of time God just has lots of time that's colorful it's poetic but it's bad physics time is a physical property time was created Albert Einstein he formulated his theory of relativity in 1905, and among other things, his theory recognizes that there's no distinction between time and space, that we live in a four-dimensional continuum, height, depth, length, three spatial dimensions, and time. There is, uh, there's an atomic clock here at the National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, Colorado. There's an identical one at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. They're accurate to within one second in a million years that's pretty accurate but each year they differ about five microseconds five millionths of a second the one in Colorado ticks five microseconds per year faster than the one in Greenwich so which one is correct they both are the one in Colorado is 5,400 feet above sea level the one in Greenwich is 80 feet above sea level the clocks are not wrong. Time itself differs due to the difference in gravitational attraction. So we all live in this four-dimensional reality of length, width, and height, and time. But God, this is where it ties into God. And in the beginning, God created. Is God is not subject to gravity. He is not limited to the constraints of mass, acceleration, or gravity. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. He is someone who is outside of the physical constraints of time itself. And he uses that very attribute to authenticate his word. Now, we're going we're gonna to show why that's important here just for a moment. My favorite Einstein quote is this. He said, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and future is only a stubborn, persistent illusion. This is exactly what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. For thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth Eternity. He is the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. He is not in our time domain. He is outside of our time altogether. Have you even taken a moment to consider a God who has no beginning? It's almost enough to make your brain explode. I used to sit at my desk in my Christian school and read scriptures like this, the God who inhabits eternity, and think of a God who has no beginning. It's hard for our finite minds to comprehend that because every one of us had a beginning. I was born at 2.42 p.m. on a Monday morning or Monday afternoon, February 1st, 1982. I had a beginning. And so in my mind, everything should have a beginning. Everything should have. But God did not have a beginning. He just is. He always was, and he always will be. So let's look at this uh, geometry of eternity here real quick. Whenever you and I uh, look at this imaginary line or this line called time right here, we're right in the middle called the present. And just behind us is the past, and a little ahead of us is the future. And so for, for us, life is a sequence of events along this line. That's that's how we look at life. It's just a sequence of events. 
uh, yesterday we had oatmeal and, and this morning we had French toast and uh, tomorrow we're going to have eggs and bacon. It's just a sequence of events that happens. That's, that's time to us, but God stands outside of time. He looks at it. So just imagine if you would like a parade. If you're looking at a parade on the edge of a sidewalk, you see it float by float. But imagine Fox 2 News and they're up there in the helicopter. They see the entire parade. That is how God sees it. This is so important. I'm not just trying to talk science and mathematics and geometry to you uh, to try to bore you tonight. You need to understand that when he said in the beginning God, when he's outside of time, it does not matter what's going on in your life right now. If he has spoken a word to you, God is going to perform it. Stop trying to get God to fit into your time schedule. You're four days late. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? I'm so outside of time. You don't understand what I'm about to do for your life. Stop your weeping, Mary. Stop your crying, Martha. I am the God who has spoken. I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, I know that at some point in the future, he's going to rise. You don't even understand or comprehend that I'm the God who brings all things to life and I bring all things to, to the front. I, I bring it up and I tear it down. I am the God of all things and I live outside of time. That's important for us to understand because sometimes like me, maybe you get a little bit edgy or maybe you get a little bit uh, uh, worried or anxious because of something that's going on in your life right now. And you look at life, you say, well, yesterday was a good day. Today's not such a good day. Maybe Christmas time uh, will be a good time together. And we put God in that. And we say, well, God really wasn't so good to me yesterday. He feels like he's a little better today. And I hope he'll be good to me tomorrow. And we try to get God inside of our time. But you got to understand that he's a God outside of time. And what he has already spoken is going to come to pass. That's why we study his word that's why you got to get the word hidden in your heart that you might not sin against God so that you don't miss the mark this is an attribute that God exploits to authenticate his message if God has the ability to create us in the first place he has the ability to get the message to us but how does God authenticate it how does he let us know that the message we have is really from him and it's not some kind of scheme or a fraud or simply ancient tradition and one way that he uses to demonstrate the origin of his message is from outside of time itself. So Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, alludes to this in Isaiah 46, verse 10. He speaks of God declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. For I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. I've come to give you an expected end. I've come to give you a hope and a future. God already has your end. He that has begun a good work in you is going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When God spoke it, it is finished. Therefore, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Because I have a word. I have a creator. I have a designer. I have a builder. In the beginning, God. Doesn't matter what happens in the middle. Doesn't matter what's going to happen at the end. Because in the beginning, God. That's why when you're born again, that is why all things become new and you step into the realm of possibilities and into a brand new kingdom because your beginning has just started. In the beginning, God. And when you start with God, all things are possible through him. Lift up your head, little sheep, and don't be worried about the big bad wolf anymore because you've got a God who is on your side, who has stepped outside of time, and who has his hand on your your life and will never let you go here's the cool thing about the bible the bible is the only book that hangs its entire credibility on the ability to write history with in advance without error think about that that that's the incredible power of this book it has an incredible ability to write history in advance without 
air. So I was looking at this book. Uh, how many of you have heard or know of Brother Arlo uh, Molenpaul? Anybody know Brother Arlo Molenpaul? What a wonderful man. Okay, many of you do. Such a wonderful man. I, I was privileged to get to know him uh, in my growing up years through my dad's uh, experience with him through Christian education and just a wonderful, uh, wonderful man. Tell you a quick story has absolutely nothing to do with tonight's topic, but I find it interesting. As we were walking at General Conference and my wife and I, we had Gentry and he was three, four maybe, old enough to run and, and kind of go around in the hallways. And we saw Brother Molin Paul. And he's a little slower in his years, but man, his mind is so quick. And so we thought we'd just get there and we get to talk to him. And here it is, one of our elders, somebody I've looked up to, brilliant mind, just loves the Lord, loves to debate, loves the Word of God. And my wife and I are standing there talking to him. And we're in a big hallway there at General Conference. Our kids are just running around. And Gentry's running around. And before we knew it, Gentry had run full force, everything that he had, as fast as he could, and jumped up on the back of Brother Molin Paul. Oh, oh, dear God, it has absolutely nothing to do with tonight's lesson. I just want you to know that Brother Mullen Paul endured, and he's still standing today. And if the Lord knows all things, he knew we were about to kill Gentry, but he survived, and the Lord was gracious unto him. I was reading a book by Brother Mullen Paul, and if you want a good book on evolution versus creationism, uh, you need to uh, read Brother Mullen Paul's book. Absolutely as excellent. So using the post-flood genealogies in Genesis chapter 11. So this is after the flood. Whenever you look at Adam all the way to Abraham, and you look at their ages and how long that they lived upon the earth, uh, scholars are able to determine that the man Abraham lived, catch it, 1,948 years after Adam. All right, so 1,948 years after Adam, Abraham was born. 1948, God speaks to a man born 1,948 years after Adam and tells him and said, out of your loins is going to come a child, and from your seed I'm going to produce a nation, and the nation is going to inhabit the land that you see before you today. That's what you're going to get. That's what your inhabitants are going to be. And he spoke that to Abraham 1,948 years after the man Adam was, was dead and gone. So here we go, 1948. And in 1948, what happens? Israel becomes a state. It becomes a nation. Now, to me, believe it or not, uh, I, I think it's more than just coincidence when God spoke to a man 1,948 years afterwards and said, I'm going to bring a nation out of you that in 1948 in our time that Israel became a nation. There had to be a little smile on God's face knowing what he was already going to plan. The Bible, it hangs its entire credibility on its ability to write history and advance without air. God already has your story written. All you have to do is put your life into his hands and believe that he's able. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you'll trust God, he will lead you all the way through to the very end. Just think about what God is able to do. When you look at the... Uh, the days of creation. Day one, let light be. Day two, he stretched out of space. I don't have time to talk about that, about Hubble and, and all of the incredible things that they discovered. And a man by the name of uh, George uh, Lemaire, but they talked about the stretching of space. And the scripture uh, confirms that day three, land of vegetation, uh, four, five, six, seven. We'll get to those in just a minute. But day one, uh, let's, let's look at day one here real quick. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, don't crucify me, those of you scholars out there, for my terrible uh, work in Hebrew right now, pronunciation. Bereshit, bera Elohim, name for God, et ha shamayim, et ha eretz. I was that close. <laughs> Didn't get it completely, but I'm that close. But you think about what God is trying to say right here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's take a little closer look at this Bereshit. Bereshit is the name of the book Genesis. It means in the beginning or in beginning. Bara, it means to create out of nothing. Only God can do that. Elohim, the name of God. So God is literally creating a world out of nothing. That's form and void. He's creating something absolutely beautiful. We've said it before. We'll say it again. If God can do that with 
with earth and space and the universe. Just imagine what he can do with the nothing in your life. Think about that, what God can do. Sometimes you look around and you want to hang your harps on the willow and think, man, there's nothing, nothing good's going to come out of this. There's nothing more that God could absolutely, you need to go back to the beginning of what God did and know that he can begin something brand new and beautiful in your life. He is a God who has the power to do that. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the earth was without form. The earth was without form. The earth was without form and void. Darkness upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Sounds straightforward enough, but there's a little problem tucked away in this verse. In 1814, Thomas Chalmers noticed something interesting in the term without form and void. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is nothing else. So this verse in Isaiah seems to indicate that the earth was not originally created without form and void, but it subsequently became that way. In fact, that, that verb uh, back here at this, uh, this verse, the earth was, that word was is haya. I like that word. Haya, it means it became. It's, it's a transitive verb. It implies action. Lot's wife Haya, a pillar of salt. Not a karate chop, but became a pillar of salt. That's the same verse. So this verse could literally be translated, the earth became without form and void. So whenever you're looking at that issue and that question right there, one suggestion is that from this hint in verse 2, possibly there's a gap, there's an interval of time, maybe billions of years uh, between verses 1 and 2. Some people dismiss that uh, gap theory and say what I believe it is. It could be a hint of a catastrophe, possibly associated with the rebellion of Satan prior to the events of chapter 3. Because Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's a pretty powerful kick in the pants out of heaven. And he was kicked out of heaven, down and hurled to this earth. Revelation 12, 9, Satan was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And look at the description in Ezekiel chapter 28. Whenever it talks about Lucifer, it says, you are the model of perfection. You're full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone adorned by you. You had ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. Look at all the beautiful stones and the beautiful uh, 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 jewels that were in Lucifer himself when he was an angel of God in the heavens. But when he got kicked out, just think of all of the stones that are in the earth right now. I, my mind likes to be a little bit creative and to think God kicked him so hard out of heaven that when he hit earth, all of his jewels went... That's how hard it was, which may be, in my little imagination, why he tries to tempt you so much to go after the gold more than after the God who created the gold. That perhaps he wants you to get distracted by the treasures of this earth and really miss the treasures that are far above. You see, when, Le when Satan lost his heavenly citizenship and authority, he was given, according to Ephesians chapter 2, the position of prince of the power of air. How would you like that? You're the prince of the power of... There you go. So right above your heads, all that air and that space right up there in the heavens, that's yours. There you go. You get some air to play with. This is what you get to do. This is your dominion right here, which is why Satan hates it when the believers pray. When you pray, you go above his head every time. That's why prayer is so important. And that's why he works so hard to get your mind to stay on temporal things. Because as long as he can keep you underneath that heaven of air, he can have dominion over your thought life and over your spirit. But if you'll ever begin to pray and transcend above his little principality and power of air, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.8, he's raised us up to sit together 
in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. The devil hates you because of the position God places a born again believer in. He has raised you Now I don't have to be the person sitting on the sidewalk worried about the parade going by me and that that floats on fire and that floats Republican or Democrat or that float doesn't look like me or that float doesn't act like me. I'm sitting in heavenly places with God's perspective knowing he's all in control and that one day every kingdom of the earth is going to burn up and be dissolved and there's only going to come one kingdom that shall reign and rule forever for of the increase of his government there shall be no end you ought to just take a moment and thank God right now for the grace of God to raise us up and sit us together in heavenly places hallelujah so you got a testimony like those old dear saints of God some of those that get up and be like pastor I just want to testify Satan's been after me all week long (laughs) Well, there's only one devil, and it's highly unlikely he's after your little carcass. But it is highly likely that maybe he sent some imps after you, or maybe you just started to believe that he's a little bit more powerful and interested in you than you think that than he really is. But what I do want you to understand is that Satan does hate you, that he does have power God's given him, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I don't have to fear. I don't have to worry. Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field. They toil not, and yet look how good they are dressed. And look at the sparrows that fall to the ground. Even the Father, he sees them when they fall. Let me tell you, child, lift up your head. God sees exactly where you're at. He sits above the time. So when you're in the valley, he sees you. When you're on the mountain, he sees you. He's got everything. And if you'll just hold on, Revelation tells us, he that endures to the end the same shall be saved right now this is what the church needs to do this is what you need to do you need to endure you need to endure right now Don't worry about getting everything together. Don't worry about having your life perfect and getting the perfect job and the perfect spouse and the perfect life. Forget about all that just for right now. Right now what the church needs to do is having done all in the evil day to stand therefore. I'm preaching right now prophetically to the church of what you need to do in this season is you need to endure. Let the fire try your faith so that when you get through, you'll be coming forth pure as gold. Stand. When you get through this, when you get through this season, you're not going to have to smell like smoke. You're not going to have to smell like you've been through the fire. Those three Hebrew boys came out after walking with that fourth in the fire, whether it was a theophany, an angel of the Lord, whoever that was, but it was, a, it was an angelical somebody from heaven was there with them walking around in the fire. When they came out, their clothes were not burned. They did not smell like smoke. You can make it through this season without any of that stuff hanging in your spirit. You can make it through 2020 without being bitter, without being discouraged, without being hateful, without being greedy and jealous, without being fearful. Oh, somebody needs to believe this right. You can make it through the fire without smelling like the smoke of the world. Because you're sitting in heavenly places. You're sitting above it all. You've got God's perspective. When you begin to pray, you begin to get heaven's perspective and perspective and begin to see what God sees. That's why the word, <laughs> the word is so important. Let's lift up our hands to the Lord right now and thank him for his everlasting word. <laughs> I thank you, Jesus, for your word. I thank you, Jesus, for your word. <laughs> Give me five, two minutes. I'll be done here in just a minute. Days three through six. God's creating all these wonderful things. Land of vegetation, sun, moon, and stars, sea animals and birds, land animals and mankind on that sixth day. And this brings up, of course, issues of fossils. I love the study of fossils. Paleontology has a sordid history of frauds and deceit. And in 120 years since Darwin, no one, no one has found a fossil of legitimate intermediate stage of any kind. Absolutely no one. Textbook examples of our supposed ancestors have all 
been discredited, some of them as deliberate frauds. You've got the Heidelberg man that was built from a jawbone. The Nebraska man, 1922, was made from just one tooth that was later discovered to be part of an extinct pig. The Piltdown Man, 1912, was made from the jawbone of a modern ape, was filed and treated with iron salts to make it look old. The Neanderthal Man, that many of us are familiar with from textbooks, was found in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf. The International Congress of Zoology in 1958 determined all the way back then that it was just an old man suffering from arthritis. The Java Man, not somebody who's had too much Starbucks coffee, but the Java Man... In 1922, was built by an 1891 skull cap and a femur. The teeth were from an orangutan. And yet, these well-documented frauds unbelievably continue to be promoted in most school textbooks. Do not give up on the word. Oh, you can scrap all the rest of your faith if you're not going to found everything that you've got on the Word of God. You can kick your religion out the door. It's not worth the hill of beans or the penny you got in your pocket. If you want to have a faith that's going to endure, then you've got to trust and build your life on the Word of God. I mean, just look at the power of the Word of God. It continues, it continues uh, to be proven even by science. Specifically, information science has underscored the role of design and creation. Uh, thermodynamics. I love studying a little bit about thermodynamics. Uh, thermodynamics, the very first law of, of thermodynamics is the conservation of matter and energy. You can't create any more matter and energy. All that there is is all that there ever will be. That's all the matter and energy that there is. You can't create anymore. Nehemiah chapter 9, it confirmed that again. It said all the things that are therein, you preserve them all. Hebrews chapter 4 says the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It's agreeing in several more scriptures. I don't have time to go through all of them. Continue to confirm even the very first law of thermodynamics. We call it the law of science. You look at the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. Entropy or the bondage of decay. You're going to like this. It says that all thermodynamic processes are inefficient. So whenever you transfer energy, you lose uh, a little bit of that energy. And entropy is also in Scripture. Psalm 103 says they shall perish. They shall grow old as a garment. Isaiah 51, 6, the earth will grow old like a garment. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. But Romans 8, 21 gives hope for all of you that are struggling with wrinkles and with uh, uh, skin decay and muscle decay and problems and all this bondage of decay that our world is in right now. Get some hope because Romans 8, 21 says the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. No more cream for the face. Come on, somebody. The bondage of decay is all going to be over. New bodies. Corruptible is going to put on incorruptible. Mortality is going to put on immortality. God is going to give us brand new bodies. Old things are passed away, and all things are going to become new. You just have to endure with what you've been given now. And he that's faithful in a little, God is going to give you a lot. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. I love this. I love this. What sin got us into, Jesus can get us out of. Satan's plan has been exposed. It's been exploited. It's been defeated. Genesis chapter 3. It's the seed plot. You want to come to the piano for me. The seed plot for the entire Bible is found in Genesis chapter 3. This is where we encounter the serpent. We realize his tactics. The Hebrew word is nakesh or the shining one. The shining one who becomes the serpent. Isaiah describes the serpent as a morning star. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Satan can never duplicate. He can only imitate what God does. Satan cannot duplicate what God does. He can only imitate it. That's why discernment is necessary to know a deception. We need a spirit of discernment. And that kind of discernment only comes from the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about a woman or a man's intuition. I'm not talking about a little feeling that I have in my finger or my hip whenever the weather changes. I'm talking about I know from the Holy Ghost that this is not of God. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us. 
The enemy has been exploited. His weapons, we are not ignorant of his devices. We need to understand that here today because the enemy is trying to get so close to replicate. He's trying to do it, but he can't. He's just trying to imitate what God has already set up, what God has already tried to do. That's why there's the Antichrist. He couldn't think of anything better. There was Christ, so he said, well, I guess I'll be the Antichrist. He's just trying to do what God, he hates God so much, which is why anybody that comes to God is in the devil's crosshairs but greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world so Adam and Eve became targets of deception from Satan and it's important to note his methodology as we conclude here tonight because he's still using the same methodology step one create doubt has God said and then he goes right into denial no you're not going to die and that's what he uses that's all he uses right there he creates doubt mm, was that God no, that wasn't God. You're not going to die. It's the doubt and then the denial. You got to watch out for it. If you allow doubt to creep into your heart, the denial is much easier to believe. He doesn't immediately come to you and say, hey, this is not true, because most of us, we, no, that, it, it is true. But if he can create a little bit of doubt, hmm, I'm not so sure about that, that promise. I'm not so sure about that verse about him healing all diseases or forgiving all sin. I don't know about all of that. And if he can create the doubt, the denial is easier to believe and to swallow. We know his devices. And the result of this deception was God's declaration of war against Satan. And in that declaration, I want you to notice the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The Lord God said unto the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed above all the cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly thou shalt go in dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life and I will put enmity, separation between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed even in the beginning God already had a plan it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel you're, you're going to give him a little bruise but he is about to crush your head and unto the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow, thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be unto thy husband. He shall rule over thee. We can't imagine or even begin to imagine the effects of God's declaration of war. He cursed the ground since from that point Adam would get his food from working and toiling in the ground. Thorns were then the symbol of the curse. And so on that cross, Jesus bore those thorns, which were literally thorns, but were also a symbol of bearing the curse for all of us. Of course, right after that, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, the eyes of them were both opened after they disobeyed God. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves apron. We had the first act of religion. Here's what religion does. Religion just tries to cover up with our own works what we got ourselves into. We just try to cover up our own sin by the work of our own hands. We got that from our father Abraham and our mother Eve. We got that from them. We thought, well, maybe it'll still work, but it doesn't. It's just a false act of religion. And Jesus, or God saw all the way through it. And he said, listen, it's, this is not going to work. Uh, we're we're going to need a better covering to that. That's, that's what religion does. Religion is always man's attempt to cover himself. But God's plan of redemption is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. And he clothed them signifying saying there has to be a shedding of blood to cover you. Fig leaves ain't going to work. But you need the blood to cover you. How many know you still need the blood of Jesus? to cover. I still need his blood to wash. Here's the whole idea tonight that we need to understand is that God sits outside of time. He had a plan from the very beginning. Adam and Eve's disobedience didn't catch God off guard and nothing in your life has caught God off guard. Nothing in our nation has caught God off guard. Nothing. Nothing that's happened in our world. There was no hurricane that he goes, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. There, there's no decision. There's no policy. There's, there's no eruption of violence that God said, I didn't see that coming. But he had a plan in place. 
that if you'll just trust in His grace, God will lead you through it. I want to encourage you, Church of the Living God, tonight to keep holding on to God's unchanging, eternal hand. Build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. Would you stand with me here tonight? I'm thankful. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that your word is forever established. I thank you that your word, it, it, it never ends. I thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. And I thank you, O oh Lord, for the faith that you have given to us. From the very beginning, you had a plan. You had it all working together. And I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. Lord, tonight I pray that you would help those who may be struggling with their faith. Those, oh Lord, who may be struggling tonight with a little bit of worry or fear or anxiety or pressure from life. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to be raised up tonight to see it from your perspective, to know, God, that time is just a physical thing. It has a beginning. It has an end. And our life, even though it's but a vapor, our life in your hands, God, we have eternal life within us because of the blood of your dear Son, because of baptism in your name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Lord, that we've been born into a brand new kingdom. And I pray for those that are watching, those that are here together tonight. I pray, Lord, that they would build their lives on your word. I pray, God, that you would stir something within them, a confidence, a boldness, a hope tonight to know that no matter what they're surrounded with, no matter what they're fighting against, Lord, that no weapon formed against them is going to prosper and that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they're mighty through you to the pulling down of every stronghold. I pray for your people tonight that their faith would be increased. I pray, oh Lord, that their eyes would be lifted up to see you, the author and the finisher of their faith. I pray, oh Lord, that you would build us up tonight as your body, as your people, as an army that's full of the Holy Ghost, full of light, Lord. I pray that you'd help us not to succumb to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us to walk in the way of righteousness. Help us to walk in the path of your word, Lord, and not stray to the right hand or to the left. I pray, oh God, that you'd open up our eyes to behold greater things, wondrous things out of your law. Help us to see you in every scripture. Help us to see your glory in all of the earth, Lord. I pray that you would open up our lives, God, to be filled full of your spirit so our cup overruns. I pray, oh Lord, for every adult tonight, every individual, every young person, every child. I pray, oh Lord, that you would bring us together in harmony and unity with your spirit. I know, Lord, that the enemy is working hard because he knows he has but a short time but oh God I thank you that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church I thank you that you got us in the palm of your hand and I worship you tonight I love you Lord would you just lift up your hands and your voice to him tonight as we conclude in thanksgiving and prayer would you just lift up your voice to the Lord if you got a care or a concern or a worry or a sin would you just surrender that to the Lord here tonight would you just put your trust and faith in him again and say Lord I believe your word I trust oh God that all things are possible with you I love you, Jesus. I thank you, O oh Lord, that you've got everything in control, Lord, that we don't have to worry, that we don't have to be afraid, God. I thank you, Lord, that you're with us, that you're never going to leave us or forsaken us. I give you praise tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship your great name. I thank you, Lord, for the revelation of this great truth tonight. I thank you, Lord, for what you're beginning in us. I thank you that you're going to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, and I worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. How many is thankful for the word of God tonight? Aren't you thankful that you've got something to build your hope on? Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I love you. Thank you for being here tonight. Love one another before you go. High five somebody. Uh, shake somebody's hand. Air, air, shake it. Whatever you got to do. But let somebody know that you love them before you leave this place tonight. Those of you that are watching online, God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a wonderful night. You're blessed. And be dismissed in the wonderful name of Jesus.